Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the final session of the In Our Image Artificial Intelligence and the Humanities Conference. I'm Robert Newman, President and Director of the National Humanities Center, and I'll be moderating this afternoon's panel. Before we get started, I want to remind everyone that you need to log in to YouTube to participate in today's discussion. You can do that by clicking the blue sign in button in the upper right hand corner of the page and entering a Gmail account. Over the past two weeks, we've discussed the various dimensions of humanistic inquiry into the rapid emergence of artificial intelligence in our lives. We've looked at how it has challenged the boundaries of humanistic thinking, as well as the boundaries of self. How the humanities might help to design more ethical and non-discriminatory models for artificial intelligence. How machine generated art extends notions of creativity. And, and about how films about the future of AI lead us to reconsider our thinking about the present. We've witnessed a demonstration of an AI platform modeled on human brain functions and seen how AI helps us analyze Shakespeare as well as promote new and evocative classroom experiences. We've discussed how notions of privacy are troubled and reconsidered in an increasingly AI infiltrated environment. We've worried about the environmental impacts of an extractive AI industry discussed notions of morality, policy, and identity, and debated utopian and dystopian views of an AI-dominated future. We've had more than 1,200 registrants from coast to coast in the US, as well as participants from Canada, the UK, Brazil, China, Germany, Egypt, India, Libya, Taiwan, and others, with some 3,000 live streams. The impact of the conference will extend beyond today's concluding panel, with videos of all conference sessions and materials being publicly available, with the creation of a new teaching syllabus, a comprehensive bibliography, a new Nerds in the Woods podcast episode encompassing the scope of the conference, and another series of more focused podcasts being produced by the graduate students who have been engaging with the conference sessions. As we conclude what has been a rich and productive ongoing exploration of the issues surrounding AI and the humanities, this afternoon we'll be discussing what lies ahead. I'm, de be I'm delighted to be joined in thinking about the future of AI and of the humanities by this final group of very distinguished panelists. Paul Alavasatos, Tobias Reese, Abby Smith Rumsey, and Sherry Wong. There are more extensive biographies for each of them available on the conference website. So I'm just going to briefly introduce all of them in alphabetical order before asking them to make a few remarks. Our first panelist is Paul Alavasatos. And later this year, Paul will assume a prestigious new position as president of the University of Chicago. But until then, he has been serving with distinction as provost and executive vice chancellor at the University of California, Berkeley, where he's also Samsung Distinguished Professor of Nanoscience and Nanotechnology. Paul has founded two nanotechnology companies, Nanosys and Quantum Dot Corp. He was the founding editor of Nano Letters and formerly served on the senior editorial board of science magazine. His work has been recognized with awards that include the National Medal of Science, the E. O. Lawrence Award, the Wolf Prize in Chemistry, the Dan David Prize, the Von Hippel Award, the Linus Pauling Medal, the Any Award for Energy and Environment, the Wilhelm Exner Medal, and the National Academy of Science Award in Chemical Sciences. Also joining us today is Tobias Rees, Tobias is the founding director of the Bruin Institute's Transformations of the Human Program. He also serves as Reed Hoffman Professor of Humanities at the New School for Social Research in New York, and as a fellow of the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research. Professor Reese's expertise lies at the intersection of anthropology, art history, the history of science, and the philosophy of modernity, 
and concerns the study of knowledge and thought. Specifically, he's interested in how categories that order knowledge mutate over time and in the effects these mutations have on conceptions of the human and what is real. I'm also pleased to welcome Abby Smith Rumsey this afternoon. Abby is a historian of ideas who writes and lectures widely on analog and digital preservation, online scholarship, the nature of evidence, the changing roles of libraries and archives, and the impact of new information technologies on perceptions of history, time, and identity. She is the author of the immensely influential 2016 book, When We Are No More, How Digital Memory is Shaping Our Future. From 2002 until 2014, Abby directed the Scholarly Communication Institute at the University of Virginia, and she previously served in leadership roles at the Council on Library and Information Resources and the Library of Congress. She was an advisor to the American Council of Learned Societies Commission on the Cyber Infrastructure for the Humanities and Social Sciences, and was senior advisor to the Library of Congress's National Digital Information Infrastructure Program. Finally, I want to welcome Sherry Wong. Sherry is the founder of Icarus Salon, an art and research organization exploring the societal implications of emerging technology. She previously partnered for, with the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences at Stanford to create Fluxus Landscape, a map of 500 actors in AI ethics and governance, and Fairer Tomorrow, an immersive experience of political and economic solutions generated during the COVID-19 crisis. She is currently a researcher in the transformations of the human program at the Bergruet Institute, a member of Tech Inquiry, and serves on the board of directors for Digital Peace Now. So we'll start with comments from each of our panelists, then move into a more general discussion and then respond to questions from our audience. So for those of you who are viewing on YouTube, please feel free to enter your questions or comments in the chat at any time. Please preface specific questions to our panelists by writing the word question in capitals, and I'll be monitoring that part of the conversation so that we can address as many of these questions as possible in the time we have allotted. So Paul, I'm gonna turn things over to you to begin. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you for that uh, wonderful introduction and also for putting together this remarkable conference. Uh, listening to all of the topics that were covered, I was filled with jealousy, wondering what was I doing with my time when all these marvelous sessions were going on? Uh, I wasn't able to participate as much as I might've liked to. Uh, I thought in my comments, I would, um, say, uh, share a few of my own observations, but I also was informed by um, six uh, arts and humanities scholars at Berkeley and six arts and humanities scholars at the University of Chicago who I asked um, about their views. And so what I will present here is kind of a, a synthesis of some of uh, my own personal views as well as what I learned from so many wonderful colleagues at those two institutions. And, um, to me, the arts and humanities and the humanities and the deepest engage on the very deepest questions that that really um, uh, all of us care about as living persons and thinking about the world around us, wanting to understand ourselves. And so it's a very timely topic to think about how artificial intelligence uh, intersects with that. I'd like to start by talking a little bit about my own experience, just for a few moments, um, as a scientist, because uh, in my own research, we use artificial intelligence and machine learning, and it has some profound limitations, as well as some enormous strengths, which I think actually bear some similarity to the situation here. Uh, we use it to explore the growth and motions of tiny crystals, the smallest ones that can possibly be made. And it's a phenomenally useful set of techniques that have emerged from AI and ML that allow us to see patterns, patterns of motion, patterns of shape, patterns of evolution. Um, and 
we have tried for some years now, over and over, to actually use it to also try to understand causes, which we would interpret in terms of, say, a deeper understanding of how physical laws are being um, uh, manifested, or or perhaps um, exceptions to those laws. And and what my experience, at least in that, has been that it's terrific at just at helping us to see patterns that we wouldn't have seen otherwise, but struggles mightily to help us understand what's really happening underneath. And uh, my impression from talking to so many colleagues in the arts and humanities is that something similar pertains here, even to this moment. Uh, it allows colleagues to, uh, across all the disciplines of the humanities that you mentioned, film and media, history, studies of culture and cultural evolution, gender, archaeology, all kinds of fields can use this to see patterns and, and have what uh, a view that uh, people call something like the big read, being able to see huge amounts of things that previously only, you know, the, the deepest close read could help to illuminate in a, in a good way. Now you can see these enormous evolution of patterns in time and uh, also um, uh, use them to characterize uh, particular situations and states. But does it go deeper? Are you able to see things more deeply? I was so struck by one of the examples, a colleague who had tried very hard to use um, a, um, uh, uh, AI machine learning kind of algorithm with natural language processing to discern whether uh, a particular piece of writing was sarcastic. And it was extremely difficult to do it. In fact, eh, maybe sometimes it succeeded by trying to contextualize, but in such limited ways that it fell so far short of what the true human experience of um, um, discerning whether a particular communication, uh, what, what its flavor is, what its nature is at a deeper sense. And, and perhaps that shows to some degree uh, the similarity I was describing between what happens um, in, in the world of, uh, in all areas of inquiry, great at seeing patterns, harder at understanding underlying uh, reasons. And, and this really matters enormously. It has to do with um, the really deep topics of the philosophy of knowledge and the philosophy of mind and how these tools intersect with those and whether they truly allow us to understand what it is to know something in a deeper way. You also mentioned the issues of ethics and of privacy, and surely those must be front and center. So my view at the two universities I'm involved in is I see the desire to use these tools because they're, they're opening up new ways of seeing things, finding patterns, and a lot of curiosity. Can it go further? <laughs> How far can it go? And, and a willingness of scholars across all disciplines to engage with each other in new ways. And so the final thing I'd like to describe is um, that I, we're trying, I think, at most institutions now to, to help create environments where the dialogue between um, those who are engaged in humanistic inquiry and those who are involved in shaping and creating these new tools are, are able to work well with each other. At Berkeley, we've, we're in the midst of creating a new um, a division that likely will eventually become a new college of computing data science and society, which will be specifically organized to enable these kinds of interactions to occur uh, in a deeper way. And uh, I see um, also at, at the University of Chicago, many new activities that have emerged that have a similar intent to them. And, and so I do believe these are deep questions. They're interesting. They shed new light on things. Um, and it's a time for us to try to enable those discussions to happen in good ways. Um, and yet I'll come back to my statement that I still think the current tools, while they're powerful in some ways, are also very limited in others. And I'll hand it back now.
Yes, thank you so much, Paul. My mouse was sticking there. Tobias, I'm gonna to turn it over to you. Thank you. Well, I first want to, to echo what Paul said. What an amazing, what an amazing conference on one of the most important topics of our time. Uh, uh, I did have the chance to zoom in on, on zoom in on many of the sessions and was uh, was uh, uh, you know my desk is scattered with associations and notes from 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 these days so a big congratulations and thank you for for inviting me to be part of this um, I, I tried to come up with some provocative thoughts at, at the end of, of the conference so I'll try my best <clears throat> To me, the becoming artificial of intelligence is uh, that what I mean by this is the emergence of a kind of intelligence that is um, different from the narrowly confined biological organisms that we that we know that can be organized in massively distributed data centers is uh, is is exquisitely exciting because it enables insights and understandings about the world, as Paul said, that are radically new in the sense that they were not possible before. And the insights that, that they open up are actually challenging how we think and understand the world and ourselves as humans, part of the world. And so one way of, of capturing my interest is to say, I'm interested in the philosophical stakes specifically of machine learning. And, and I try to imagine or think a long time about how could I articulate that? And so maybe one way to try that is to say, I'm interested in, in the history of concepts. I'm interested in the history of the implicit conceptual assumptions that silently organize how we human think about ourselves, how we experience the world. Conceptual assumptions, each one of us would be actually hard pressed to articulate because they're so implicit that, uh, that we tend to be unaware of them. And the form my research takes is actually, uh, it can go in two directions. One is I like to go back in time, like an ablation experiment, uh, where gradually concepts that we take for granted today disappear. And so the term culture, the concept of society, the first time the concept of consciousness was used by John Locke, you go further back, the term of the, the concept of the body disappears. And at one point you end up at the moment in time where none of the terms that we take for granted when thinking about the world existed. What other conceptual orientations existed? What was it like to be human to experience the world at that time? The second form my research around these conceptual assumptions takes is what happens when a, a fundamentally new concept emerges? How does it reorganize how we think about ourselves, how we can think about ourselves? How does it reorganize how we understand the world and how it is composed and, and what new kinds of institutions and even infrastructures of education does it make possible? And one of the concepts I, I spent literally 20 years researching now is at the very center of, of uh, the name of the National Humanities Center and of this workshop, and that is the human. And it's interesting that it is easy today to take it for granted that there is something like the human, something that all of us share, in, that all humans share, independent of whether they're old or young, independent of whether they're rich or poor, independent of their gender, the color of their skin, something that is truly universal, the human. However, such a a universal concept of the human or such an, a concept that in its aspiration is universal and time and place independent did not always exist. The first time it surfaces is actually in Europe in the 17th century. And that's important because the human is not a given, it's a project. And when this project began, it, it, it was given a particular kind of form and that form was that humans, the human, humans are more than nature, more than animals or, or plants, and that humans are qualitatively different, irreducibly different from machines. So you could say the human, more than nature, other than machines. So the 
the differentiation of nature, humans, and technology into three different ontological realms is precisely what happens in Europe about 400 years ago. And it's really, really, really impossible to overestimate how important that is. You look at the language we moderns have available to talk about the human, art, culture, history, politics, society, etc. All of these terms imply that the truly human, that which sets us apart, opens up once we leave the state of nature, art, culture, civilization, right? It's always like once you leave the state of nature, there's this history, is this open space that begins when humans leave nature and so on. Um, humans have society, animals don't. Why? Well, because animals don't discuss how they live together. Humans give form to how they live together. That's the historical idea. Um, same thing with, you know, machines are machines. They're mechanical, they're determined, they don't have reason or intelligence. So uh, it's as if the distinctively human is not accessible in natural terms or in technical terms. Now you look at the, at the university and how it is classically organized. You have a faculty of arts, which is focused on the human in so far as it's more than nature and other or different from machines. You have a faculty of science or the sciences, which is concerned with, the, with, na with nature, with the vast field of nature from na nano uh, technology or chemistry to solar galaxies. And you have a third faculty, the faculty of, of engineering, which is concerned with machines and technology. It's precisely an interest, like this organization is indebted to the emergence of a new concept of the human 400 years ago. And I, I do think that the vast critique of AI that we see today is informed by this, by this structure of the human. We defend the human against the machine. We def AI doesn't understand. AI is not embodied. It's, always, it, it's actually quite surprising how predictive the, the critique is. And it's just a technology. It will never be self-aware. Don't fool yourself. It's, so simultaneously, there is a whole movement that is against human exceptionalism. Humans are not more than nature. We know that today, they're microbial. So this is a funny assumption. And are we humans indeed truly qualitatively different from machines? Are the machines that machine learning engineers built today actually even remotely, do they even remotely resemble the, the idea of the machine that we operate with when we critique machine learning? Are we humans a kind of learning machine among learning machines? So there are lots of big, big philosophical questions at stake in machine learning as it happens today. Basically, from my perspective, what's at stake is the status and the understanding of the human. What's at stake is whether reality is really organized into human things, natural things, and technical things as the infrastructure of the university suggests. And if that's not the case, then we have to think again. And this thinking again is not a theoretical invitation. It's actually an empirical invitation. We have to bring philosophy, art, and technology together. We have to have philosophers and artists in AI labs who work with them, study the transformations of the human that AI brings about, and thereby learn from AI, but simultaneously guide it. Um, so that's that's my provocation at the end. Is the human that we defend against the machine actually defensible? Do we really want to defend that, that concept of the human? And are the, the machines that we critique actually anywhere looking like, like the classical industrial machines that we, that we tend to critique? Thank you. Thank you, Tobias. Abby. Thank you very much. I'm also very delighted to be here. I want to warn everyone that I am, after all, a historian, so my credentials for forecasting the future may be doubted by some or many. Um, but there is one thing that historians do understand, and that is how we um, use the past to imagine the future. And it's both an excellent model and it's also got a lot of hazards. So I want to talk about both of those. And then I want to ask uh, many more questions than we can answer, but I think should be flagged for discussion. To sum up the current state of knowledge about the brain, the mind that we distinguish from machine, we know that the mind is embodied. Its operations focus on the homeostasis of the body of which the mind is a part, a controlling part, but also a reacting part. 
Memory plays a critical role in enabling the mind to recognize patterns and project them into the future. And it does this in order to let us survive by anticipating future events. So whether you're a human or a hyena, your brain is always scanning for what might feed you, what might frighten you, or what might sexually fascinate you. And one thing that Paul mentioned about pattern recognition and seeing what's beneath it, humans actually have absorbed so much of this pattern that they don't notice it. There's, the salience is always what lies outside of the pattern. And so I think that that's just an important point for scientists to get at. And I'd like to be reassured that it's not just the pattern making of machines that throw out the outliers, uh, but in fact include them and understand they're emotionally salient. So if human intelligence is by definition always embodied, what does this mean for AI, which is not embodied? How can AI be intelligent in ways that serve human ends? How can we keep AI from replacing those ends with its own? And by this, I'm sort of um, just pointing to the nightmare scenario of how um, the ultimate AI who jettisons us into the void of space without oxygen. This is of course a nightmare, but one of the great things as to be as pointed out is that artists have a way of, of letting us see what our nightmares are to frighten us and to warn us. Um, so God bless filmmakers. So the, the subject of AI and its closeness or proximity to human intelligence is of great attention. And I'd have to say megabuck funding on some campuses. So a local university here in the Bay Area, not Berkeley, has created a human-centered AI initiative. And here is how they describe their mission. I'm gonna quote from their website. We are on the cusp of the age of artificial intelligence. The scope and scale of impact of the age of AI will be more profound than any other period of transformation in our history. AI has the potential to radically transform every industry and every society. If AI is to serve the collective needs of humanity, it must incorporate an understanding of what moves us physically, intellectually, and emotionally. It is critical that we design machine intelligence that can understand human languages, feelings, intuitions and behaviors and intentions, and interact with nuance in multiple dimensions. To achieve this, the creators and designers of AI must be broadly representative of humanity. This requires a true diversity of thought across gender, ethnicity, nationality, culture, and age, as well as across disciplines. So that is from Stanford's H a HAI site, Human Centered Intelli Artificial Intelligence, which is headed by both a philosopher and a computer scientist. And I think that its goals are by and large correct. Um, and it's a very rich feast that they've laid before us. I can see that for scientists, engineers, and developers of artificial intelligence, AI begs a number of questions. So what is intelligence? How does a human differ from a machine? Which aspects of human intelligence can AI mimic and which ones should it mimic? That is, what should it do to replace humans by complementing and extending human capacities that such things as logical processing, reading data at scale, assembling machine parts on a factory floor and taking over very dangerous jobs like disarming bombs and going into radioactive sites. For humanists, on the other hand, the development AI presents to me, an enormous opportunity to revisit the questions we've been addressing for millennia. What is intelligence? What is technology? And this is a subject I think we humanists underexplore and over theorize. This is a real problem for us, I think, in addressing a dialogue with engineers and scientists. What are the moral and ethical questions raised by the development of a new technology? Well, let me turn to the Greeks. Um, according to Plato, Socrates thought that writing would undermine our moral fiber by outsourcing the work of memory to a technology, that is to writing. Um, people would not hold knowledge in their minds, just knowledge about where to find the knowledge. In other words, it would turn everybody into graduate students or teenagers with smartphones. How would we answer this question about technology in general? It, this will inform all of our deliberations. We shouldn't let anyone lose sight of the fundamental question about the relationship between outsourcing human tasks to serve human ends and the need to take responsibility for the consequences of doing so. This is where I think ethics come in and they will, ethicists and humanists will play a very important role, historians I might add, in helping people who are designing these systems to understand the potential consequences of what they can do. Um, 
So to repeat, this is a great time to be a humanist, maybe um, among the best. We get to re-examine the meaning of human, of intelligence, of artificial and of machine. The least we can do is to historicize the work of AI so that in the future, AIers will not boast, and here I quote again, the scope and scale of impact of the age of AI will be more profound than any other period of transformation in our history. AI has the potential to radically transform every industry and every society. Maybe, but so did movable type and the combustion engine and birth control pills. No one foresaw the full consequences of any of these inventions. So I say in all humility as a humanist and historian, let us track them in real time and steer them towards our desired ends. Above all, let's avoid the confusion of means with ends Machines do not have moral intentions, appearances to the contrary. Let's avoid the teleological drive towards, quote, the radical transformation of every industry and every society. Let's instead remember that in the end, it's still just us folks down here running the soundstage from behind the curtain. So my question is to um, ourselves and to the audience, how do we get there from here? How do we engage in productive collaboration with the science and engineering communities? in the academy, in the public sector, and in the private sector. And here I'm gonna turn to Paul in particular as someone who's assuming the August role of president of the University of Chicago um, and others. We need to change the way we work, how we fund the work, how we recognize and, re and reward it within the academy. I mean, after all, how many years have we con had conversations in the academy about the changes needed in the incentive and reward system for scholars in the digital realm? If we haven't gotten this very far in the digital realm, we will really be left far behind in the world of AI. So that is my question. How do we get there from here? Thank you very much. Back to you. Thank you very much, Abby. Sherry. Thank you. Um, I am so excited to be here because I already have a whole bunch of notes just from opening remarks. Um, so I think we have a lot of different and at times competing narratives when we come to AI. Uh, so when we ask you know, what the future of humanities and AI is, what AI exactly are we talking about? Um, last week, Meredith Bruthsard was on the panel and she placed AI in, um, she talks about it as a machine and, and just math. And I really agree with her because I think it grounds um, how AI functions in the real world, right? But um, there's a lot of other people talking about AI and there's other narratives. We have um, companies talking about AI, research teams, PR teams, entire countries. And there are pop culture references like uh, the nightmare scenario of Hal or the friendly companion helper, like a pet. And then there's like more serious stories like, and I have visual aids, the race for AI where US and China are battling for dominance. We've got um, the singularity and transhumanist kind of thinking and um, stories of AI where AI is so powerful, it can cause existential risk. And then on the other side, we have stories that maybe pay a little bit deeper attention. They might only come in pamphlet form, but these are ones where tech workers are battling companies who have a lot of power in, and they think of themselves as maybe whistleblowers or canaries in the coal mine. And then we have the dark side of AI, where algorithms are um, not powerful, futuristic things, but really already in use and increasing inequality. And furthermore, it's in every sector um, and it's taken in context. So some people look at vulnerable communities who can experience further harm, like AI used in criminal justice and surveillance. So um, one narrative I've seen, also going to the Greeks, um, I've seen it in AI research and it's um, thinking of computer scientists as actors in different mythologies. And one myth used is um, Icarus. So and a reminder for some people, um, Daedalus is, is an inventor and he's imprisoned in, in the tower and he builds wings of wax and feathers so he and his son can escape. And he tells his kid um, not to fly too close to the sun because the wax will melt from the heat and not fly too close to the ocean because the wings could get wet. So it's a really easy myth for technologists and AI researchers as like a warning for hubris and also to maybe stay on the middle path, have some ambition not to get your wings wet. But um, 
I see it talked about in, a, in AI on how like we should be navigating um, the, these technologies. And I named my org after it, but I didn't really choose it after the myth because um, although I enjoy what people hear because it evokes in people lots of different reactions, we all have our individual connection to mythology, but I'm really interested in counter narratives. So my reference is a reference to the painting by Bruegel. Oh, painting, this one behind me. So um, this painting, uh, you can't really see Icarus. It's, he's right there. He's, um, and you just see his legs sticking out. He's already, um, you know, it's not like his height of his success. He's already fallen. He's struggling underwater. The focus of this painting is not on that story. It's on everything else. It's on the ships that are sailing away. It's on this fisherman, the shepherd shepherding, a uh, plowman. There's a strange head in the forest too. It's like, let's not get into that one, but, um, so there's all this other stuff happening. So the reason I chose it, because there's a lineage of artists and poets like Auden and William Carlos Williams, who criticize and reinterpret this painting to their own time. So I placed my work in AI ethics as like an advocate and an artist in that lineage. And in order to, for us to center the conversation, not on the technology of flying or the engineer that's fallen, or the inventor that gets away, but instead on everybody else, the people whose lives these systems are deployed on. I think in this way, we can really cut across the modern mythologies we have created of the genius inventor and their magic machines to propose an alternative that maybe AI is a collective enterprise. After all, it's kind of built from our collected data. It's animated by our collected narratives. And I think that might necessitate that it is governed collectively as well. So if we can think of AI as a collective enterprise, then we can also think of AI as culture. Maybe AI has even been in development since uh, we've come together in groups. Um, my friend, the painter Francis Reuter, he um, talks about AI or artists as migrants. Artists move from one idea to another idea, from one material to another material. So in that momentum, artists catalyze material into generative forms. A lot like machine learning, or as Paul and Abby were talking about, pattern recognition. So artists do that as well. We can recognize which direction forms are taking. In scientific research, it's often a mistake or some outside left field comment that can really trigger unexpected breakthroughs, or it can reverse the direction of thinking or inquiry, or lead an idea completely down a different path. And I think those are the kinds of things that we need in AI governance. And um, as the world's sort of looking around for answers on how we're supposed to navigate our relationship here and govern and make policies, I think artists can help. And I think that artists, which I use that word very loosely because I think everyone is an artist, as long as you are something that is other than the consumer of culture, if you create or generate anything at all, you might be an artist, you're a maker of culture. And so there's not really a stronger force than that creative generative power when it comes to making cultural change. So if we take all these various perspectives, I wanna ask if there's something unique about AI that makes it different from how other technologies have impacted humans. A lot along um, Abby's line of thinking, there's that historical aspect, but is there something different here? So I thought it might be kind of um, fun to ask AI this question too. Um, my friends and I have a, a Zoom karaoke group, as one does these days, and one of us built a GPT-3 chatbot that can write songs. Um, GPT-3 is a language model from OpenAI, which is very good, almost too good. But at the same time, as people are very scared about how good it is, it is also not that very good because it takes a lot of like editing and human selection. And I think it's really much better at writing song lyrics because it's sort of open to interpretation when there are mistakes. So I asked um, AI about this, and here is the song it wrote for us. It's called AI, What If Today Were Tomorrow? We are all information. This is the beginning of the end. The future of mankind is here. We are all information. What if today were tomorrow? Would we continue to exist in the same way? Will we still be human or will we evolve? We are all information. What if the song you're listening to right now is the last thing you'll ever hear? 
We are all information. What if today were tomorrow? Would we continue to exist in the same way? Will we be still be human or will we evolve? We are all information. What if today were tomorrow? Would we continue to exist in the same way? Will we still be human or will we evolve? All right. What if today were tomorrow indeed? Um, thank you all for such thoughtful, provocative and, and stimulating conversation and, and questions. What I'm, <clears throat> I'm gonna ask you all to unmute yourselves at the risk of feedback here. So we can sort of just jump into conversation um, around some of the questions that you've already articulated. And I'd like to try to encapsulate things by starting with Abby's question. Um, how do we get there from here? Asking also is a corollary question, where is there? And if I can kind of try to frame this by thinking back on a comment that was made in a panel last week by uh, Chayton Dubay, who was uh, demonstrating his, uh, his AI platform that he created, Amelia. And Chayton, in the course of that conversation, uh, said at some point, by the year 2025, you will pass someone in a hallway and not know if that, if that someone is human or android. And so is that there? Um, is that where we want to get to? And what kinds of social norms and organizations of knowledge would be inculcated by such a transformation, to go back to Tobias's point. So big, broad question, but let's start there. Um, Robert, I, oh, so go ahead, Paul. You, you're braver than I am. Well, I just, you know, there was a moment of silence there because the question was such a uh, provocative one. Uh, but having listened to uh, all of the colleagues here on the uh, Zoom discussion, and it was so interesting to hear what everyone had to say, really. Uh, I come down, I think, uh, more in the category of this is an enormous methodological development that's of enormous practical utility, but more limited than what you just suggested. Uh, I, I see it as far more, I, I don't think we will suddenly feel that we are um, uh, surrounded by uh, technical entities that we perceive of as being uh, human. It, it, maybe we will relate to them uh, as we relate to many objects as, if, as though they were human because of our psychological makeup, our way of doing things. But, but uh, I think we'll still know the difference and that the, the, I think the proper way to think about what these tools are is as profoundly helpful methodologically, but still limited. <laughs> That's my view. Uh, and, and also, I just also wanted to say in terms of the kind of op somewhat apocalyptic viewpoints, uh, I mean, uh, having been involved in a few different kind of waves of science that have come through the world, for example, uh, when the area that I, I've been involved in in nanoscience and nanotechnology um, was fairly new, there were a lot of predictions about many things that it would do that would completely disrupt society. <laughs> and I'm not saying that it hasn't had impacts on society, some positive, some negative, but the sort of, um, the more um, uh, expansive ones that were really kind of, uh, uh, apocalyptic in their nature certainly have not materialized. We, we, we don't have the ability to um, completely make uh, gray goo that will consume the planet or things of that kind, you know, it's just beyond our means. So, so that's, I have a much more limited view of it. I think it's great, very powerful, but, but limited. Yeah, I, I would agree with Paul. I also have a, a view that it's limited or that we tend to exaggerate it in our minds as we project it forward. Not that that's necessarily a bad exercise in imagination, 
But to take it seriously and not see it as an act of imagination, I think is quite a mistake. Um, I, I will say when I asked the question, how do we get there from here? I would, um, I just put a stake in the ground that I don't believe in teleological views of these technologies. I think that by looking at that, by looking teleologically, we miss what's actually right in front of us. And that's where great ethical mistakes are made. And that's where people with bad, bad intentions can gull us into performing bad things without um, their accepting the consequences of them. Um, I would also say that, you know, technologies are, um, you know, when I said, how do we get there from here? I was thinking in a much more focused way on how do we develop relationships between humanists and the scientists and engineers. So I wanna know how we actually develop the means of communication between these groups, rather than getting to a plot to, you know, plotting out an idea about how to get to a specific end. I think plotting towards a specific end, again, teleologically is a real trap. And I would much rather see us focus on the human dimension of finding a new way to work together I don't believe there is this great rift between the, you know, the two cultures. They, they really began the same. And I think that um, they essentially are the same. They're, they're research-based and um, they're still part of this, uh, in the American public's eye, this kind of elite who, who cannot be trusted. We still have the same problems of developing a way of communicating with the public about what we're doing. And rather than focusing on our differences, I think that we need to, um, again, learn how we need to find ways within the academy to, um, to institutionalize dialogue and collaboration and reward that rather than the much more narrow disciplinary rewards that are now um, seem to be monopolizing scholarship. Let, let me take a contrarian view just so that it's more interesting. Um, so I agree and disagree. Um, I do think that AI is, um, has already brought about and that we are seeing many more of, like has already brought about this, an enormous transformation and that we will see much more of that. I do agree, however, that uh, the Android story is extremely unlikely and is actually an unfortunate one. I don't think that the goal should be to build AI that is human-like. We already have human-like AI. You know, it, we, we are human, that, that, that's fine. AI can do things that humans cannot do. It's a new form of intelligence, a non-human form of intelligence. Whether you, you know, uh, what, what DeepMind has done with protein folding is a perfect example. But there are other examples. We, we heard about GPT-3. There are exactly two kinds of critiques that GPT-3 gets. It's not understanding. Understanding is something only humans have. It cannot, uh, it cannot uh, operate on the level of meaning or context is the other, is the other big critique. So um, GPT-3 is producing 5.4 billion words a day, right now, a day. That means in three days, GPT-3 produces more words than all medium articles combined in a whole year. This is enormous. There are non-human words out there. They're not grounded in human experience, et cetera. These words do things in the world. This is, this is big. Someone has to think about this, right? Um, then um, take something like climate change. Do we have any knowledge of climate change without AI, without sensors, without satellites, without distributed um, computation centers that can actually collect all of this data and make it into something consistent that we call climate change knowledge or planetary or, or earth systems, none of it. So there's so much change that AI is bringing about. The whole internet is AI. Um, I, I do think that the, that the changes are enormous, but they're of a kind that we do not pay attention to. Facebook you know, connects 3 billion people every day into a single network. And this, this single network runs diagonal to national societies. Right now we can bring Facebook or these networks only negatively into view what the effect of these networks is on societies. Where, is, where, where are the people who study this network as a single thing, understand its inner dynamics, understand how it's reorganizing reality, modes of communication, 
how we communicate, what we communicate, what we understand communication to be or information or truth. These are enormous changes happening right now. And in so far as these networks run diagonal to societies, no social reform, no social legislation will do anything to, to tame them. We need to, to think differently. And this does not, this um, requires, like Abby says, conversations and dialogues, but not between social scientists and, and engineers, but between you know, new kinds of things because society is not so much what's at stake. There is like a whole new something, a whole new reality where social anthropology fails because it's a, it's a kind of network anthropology, if you will. So in my full disclosure, I'm actually working on this project with Tobias of looking at um, networks and um, data and data brokers and all the infrastructure behind. So let alone live in the sort of future of um, powerful AI that we've seen talked about, but um, I don't think we even understand like the past couple of years, <laughs> 10 years ago, because it's changing really fast and, and we don't, um, we can't really define it even in our policies when we say like, well, this is a data broker or this is, a, this is AI, it's, it's just shifting. And um, the way we're working with data is sort of revealing itself that like we might not even need to um, own or look at this data. We just need to take its value from it. We just need to extract from it in these other sorts of ways. But um, how, how, where do we get to is sort of where we are right now. Like we do need a lot more um, transdisciplinary kind of work. We've seen a lot of um, tech companies hire sociologists and, and other types of social sciences a little bit, but it hasn't gone well. And we've had um, a lot of scandals recently, right? Google's firing of Tim Gebru, for example, and then Margaret Mitchell right after as well. And what I've seen happen, which is very sad, but maybe not too sad for academia, is a lot of um, AI researchers get disheartened and um, sad about not wanting to work with companies anymore because it's not a welcoming environment for um, the kind of work they want to do, which is ethical and beneficial and responsible and all those other buzzwords like trustworthy because they really think about it deeply you know and they are part of another community where they're being critical of the work they're doing while they're doing it and they've been um, affected by the social sciences and humanities you know people are not isolated on islands they have friends they talk and they're turning now back to academia I mean like well maybe I can find a place in academia maybe I can be a professor and I can do my research there even if the compute power and the technical capabilities of a university research center can't compare to DeepMind or, you know, or OpenAI where they have a lot of resources. But even in academia, I hear they're not really fully able to be themselves because um, there is like, where does the money for those labs come from? Can you still be critical of Microsoft or Google when the, your lab is sponsored by that? So they just feel like there isn't a, a place to go. And I think if we could address that and make a place for AI researchers and people from the humanities and social sciences to work together without um, stakeholders. <laughs> but it's, it's just a, you know, there's, it's, there's conflict right here. There's a, it's a trade-off of needing the power and the money to be able to do this kind of work. And then the people who have that power and money. So th that's, Let's extend that a little bit, um, particularly in terms of the changes that need to take place in academia and in the intersection between uh, the corporate world and academia. Um, uh, Paul gestured toward this, as, as did Abby. And um, uh, in, in my own experience as a, as a former dean and, and also a vice president for interdisciplinary studies at the university that I came from uh, prior to taking this position, it's, it's, it's been a struggle for so it strikes me that for all the accusations of um, that universities are the bastions of neo-Marxism, they are probably some of the most conservative institutions that we have in, in this country, uh, pr primarily in, in holding on to the departmental structures, um, where a lot of the most interesting interdisciplinary uh, work is taking place in centers and institutes and these various kinds of uh, interesting intersections uh, that, that we see emerging. But the reward system and the promotion system is still uh, very much steeped in those departmental, um, somewhat archaic structures uh, that we now have. So 
uh, I'm sure many of us have thought about changes that might take place. And, and can we go there a little bit in terms of uh, how we get there? It's a very important set of questions for those of us in the academy, for sure. And uh, I guess I have a couple of thoughts to share on it. Uh, one of them is that uh, there are some disciplines, but they are disciplines where the idea of uh, collective scholarship is very well established, uh, very well. Uh, and so for example, let's say if we look at um, uh, recently, maybe you saw the report of um, those uh, very evanescent muons being used to understand something about uh, uh, the nature of um, how, how what happens to one particle actually reveals all possible particles present. <laughs> it's a very, very interesting kind of concept in the high energy physics world. Uh, that involved, uh, when I watched the, um, the uh, unveiling of that result, there were 500 uh, scientists all who had been an important part of it. And uh, the roles of each one of them very distinct from actually many different disciplines within that area. And uh, we're all celebrated. And, and there was a perfectly good way of uh, recognizing uh, that people had made good contributions and existing inside the academy perfectly well. Uh, and I see that happening in a lot of disciplines in the universities. But there are some where the um, uh, scholarship is really conducted um, or let's say there's a bit of a fiction that the scholarship is conducted entirely individually. <laughs> and um, I, you know, I, I think that even in those disciplines, let's say disciplines where writing a book or making it, you know, it's something you really do individually is, is what's, what's typically looked for. Um, that even in those, obviously the impact of the community around them, their network, the kind of connections they have, profoundly influences them. We just don't choose to account for it. And uh, so I, I think that's a really important topic to, to, to talk about and to try to find, find ways to recognize that, that there's collective scholarship almost in every discipline. Um, and, and the universities are in some cases finding more ways to do that. And I think this very dialogue that we're having right now uh, can actually be helpful because it can open up the possibility to create some structures that really move uh, very far across disciplines because at the moment it's advantageous to do that. You can just do better scholarship <laughs> if you do that. And, and, and scholars want to do the best work that they can. So, so I see opportunity here for that. It's a real issue. And it's, I, I guess I would say it's a, universities change slowly, but they do change. And, and some of that is happening now. Yeah, I have a question about that for, for everybody, but in particular for, for Paul. Um, So it, it, it's kind of a two-layered question. Question one is uh, about paradigm shifts or, or unexpected discoveries in the sciences uh, that are initially met with fierce uh, opposition and eventually you know, are, are, are the talk of yesterday. So let's say in many places around the world, the, the, the assumption that the, the ultimate human brain can generate new neurons and is actually a living biological organ rather than a neurochemical machine was controversial for five to 10 years. And then now we've, we've seen the last few years the discovery that many of the neurotransmitters in our brain are made by bacteria living in our gut, bringing a f you know two fields together, microbiology and neuroscience that traditionally um, are not exactly associated. And it requires new kinds of new kinds of experimental protocols between two scientists that were non-existent before. It's a new reality they must work together. You could say robotics and machine learning. Robotics is traditionally based on control-based uh, programming, right? And so, so every sensor on a robot arm is basically control of position in space. But when you add machine learning, the sensors must you know, generate data that the machine that, that you then can learn from. 
Roboticists don't like that. They say the machine learning guys are, you know, have no clue of the physics and mechanics of, of movement and they just think about software. So new protocols are necessary, new forms of a, a division of labor that is not grounding in a predating sort of understanding of the task. Meaning, you, you know, I'm an expert on A, you're an expert on B, let's work together. No, no, the, the new kind of thing requires something that works diagonal to this. And so there is a three, more than 300 year old uh, assumption that the dignity of the human must be defended against the biologization of, of the human or against uh, reducing humans to machines. And it takes time to open that up but isn't, isn't the, best, the best and most powerful way to accomplish this designing new curricula? Basically, they're, they're, uh, instead of trying to, exist, to change existing structures, which is incredibly hard, uh, let's design new classes where you cannot distinguish whether something is a philosophical or a social or an artistic or a technical question. The technical in itself becomes visible as a philosophical question, as a societal question. Um, and the more of this you, you produce, the more you produce people who do not want to choose between. And I, I you know, in my experience, young people don't want to choose. So is, is that the way forward? Basically building new education centers rather than new research centers? I'm just curious. <laughs> well, I, I, others may wish to respond to that, but I will say, because I, I was an undergraduate at the University of Chicago, and one of the things that um, makes me especially love that place and makes me so happy going back there is the core curriculum. And um, as a scientist, I can tell you without any hesitation that I learned um, more methods for thinking in my world of science from my humanities classes <laughs> than I did from my science classes where I learned specific things, methods. But, but the kind of uh, really deeper engagement around ideas, uh, I learned in those classes in a profound way. So I guess, you know, to be honest, my feeling about that is... It's important to have, to learn at that stage, many ways of thinking. Think of those as kind of languages and new languages are being invented all the time, but knowing some of the ones that already exist helps you learn more. Uh, so I, I'm not convinced that that model is completely wrong, but it's limited. And as you get further along in the academy, it can become more limiting. Uh, and it's important then to try to open up opportunities, precisely as you said, for people to be operating, even calling it across disciplines may not be right. I don't disagree with you. They just have to operate in an environment where they can draw from the ideas that they want to draw from to put new things together in a kind of synthetic way. And, and, and it's true, universities struggle to create those environments. They do it inside institutes and centers. And uh, those have uh, strengths and weaknesses. So, so um, it, it's a real topic for, for exploration. If there's a better structure, we should try to find it. We're creating this, as I mentioned, computation, data science, and society. And but let me just reflect on one thing that's out there as a topic for us in that. Uh, we might have, uh, we've proposed the idea that inside it, we might create something called uh, a data science commons where people might come together for periods of five years around um, a topic that they want to explore. My biggest worry about it is it won't go away. <laughs> They'll still be there after 20 years and they'll want to become departments. Uh -huh. <laughs> so the real question is, are we able to tolerate a lack of permanence at the, for the price of being able to operate freely across all boundaries? Yeah, if, if, unless Sherry has something to say right now, I, I would add that um, I was also thinking about the model of, or focusing on undergraduate education where many courses are now taught by several faculty members because they're covering one topic, but from different methodological perspectives. 
So you could have, you know, um, philosophy and cognitive science or um, something about the history of food would, in, would involve biologists and agriculturalists and, of course, historians. So I was also thinking that, you know, my, my main concern about the disciplinary structure is, is seeing, um, it's really very proximate, which is seeing computer science students coming along speaking grand language about wanting to invent things for the betterment of humanity. And I think they have not been exposed to very much conversation about what humanity is. I don't know what they mean by what's good for humanity. And I found that in the language even of the Stanford, you know, human-centered AI project. Um, whose idea of humanity are we talking about? I think the biggest um, obstacle towards this sort of scientific and engineering community here, excuse me, I'm being very gauche in these generalizations, that in the humanities, is um, it isn't so much methodological as this um, understanding of what knowledge is. For a humanist, a, a really great question is one that actually has no finite answer. There is no ultimate truth to it. And this is the opposite of the way science and engineering works. Thank God, because I wouldn't want a bridge built by people who couldn't decide on where the ultimate weight bearing um, <laughs> load would be. So, I mean, we're, you know, to some extent they're talking at cross purposes, but I think in, in for this specific project, we need to inculcate, and maybe it starts only in undergraduate curriculum, um, an ability to, to think in both ways of processing information, both those open-ended questions that involve a lot of, you know, just gritting um, and staying with it and knowing that there's no ultimate answer, you have to keep revisiting it. And those disciplines, those fields of knowledge, which are extremely cumulative and really do rely on um, the things that Newton discovered um, and the things that Galileo discovered and, and building on that. Whereas in the humanities, there's really no question philosophy epitomizes this. There's no question that's ever been answered ultimately. So I think that's maybe one way of thinking about not the structural way, um, uh, the sort of, I don't know, departmental focus, but rather within the structure of departments and institutes, how to bring those those ways of inquiry and understanding truth together so that we won't actually have um, artificial intelligence researchers talk about finding you know, the best solution for humanity. Because what is humanity? Who's humanity? This is the question that you know, humanists are now totally absorbed in is who counts? When we talk about humans, who counts? Who gets to, whose voice is heard in the conversation? It's not a conversation that's held in the same way within the scientific communities. So it's just a, that's another factor that comes into discussions about AI. Um, so just that's my word is caution about how we define what humanity is. And maybe that's where we start to discuss it between the different disciplines. Well, um, piggybacking on that, I've seen a lot of, um, I guess it's sort of a trend, research on um, making an AI lexicon and depending on like what background you come from or who you're working on uh, with, they are really radically different. So um, like Omar Rheingold over at Stanford, he's a computer scientist, he's gathered people. It's very interdisciplinary because there's like lots of different people from different, um, I guess, departments who are coming up with words from computer science that need to be explained so that we all have like a, a base level of understanding for these terms. And then we have um, people like Maya and Dira Ganesh, who is also um, a fellow at the Gruen Institute. And she has a project called A is for Another. And hers is a lot more media theory and um, just super creative about like, where, how do we define like human and humanity? That kind of stuff is in there. And then we have um, over at Berkeley, um, AFOG, the Algorithmic Fairness and Opacity group that Deidre Mogan does, which is um, a fantastic group that has, I think that is a really great group because they have all these different kinds of minds there from different departments and they work with other people outside of the university. There's just like a free flow of information there and they have a, a project on creating an alternate lexicon. And AI Now has a project now called AI Lexicon where they're calling on people bring their words from um, different communities that are international. Like what does fairness mean if you're in India, you know? So they're, they're publishing all this. I think it, it, when we're trying to find that common ground, you just almost naturally start to um, spread out and connect to people outside of your own sector. You know, I, I'm much more pessimistic in some way. I, I, I'm not, 
don't know exactly how to put it. So what mo most of the social science efforts about AI, the way I read it is that it, AI is reduced to uh, a social phenomenon. What I mean by this is um, AI engineers will talk about as, and, and Abby uh, uh, cited nicely from the HAI web page, you know, biggest uh, event ever in the history of humanity is going to change everything. You should talk about it. And then who talks about it? STEM people and the humanities people are absent. I, I agree with that. Simultaneously, most of the social science efforts are basically saying, well, let's look at this. Um, the people who invest in AI are located in society. They're here. The people who do AI are also here. The people who profit from AI are also here. And the rest of society is excluded. And so AI really is a social phenomenon and must be addressed in social theory language. And at that point, uh, AI comes into view usually as a kind of capitalist plot against society and, and must be mediated on that level. Uh, this, this is a little cliche, but I'm actually uh, pretty certain that the cliche upholds in, or, you know, uh, in, in many areas. And then there are some questions that are, that are not going to be asked that I find very fascinating. Um, one way to try to articulate that is is um, it's difficult for, for me to articulate that because it always implies a sort of history of, of, of concepts, a history of, uh, of ways of thinking. But let's assume for a second that, that um, the concept of society is a very recent one and that the idea that humans are social beings in the sense of living in society is a very recent one. In fact, I, you know, historical research would show that it pops up only in the 1880s and 1890s. Um, and so you, you, you could try to show that, that um, how the idea of society merges, how it begins reorganizing all of humanity into national societies, the social, you know, once it's discovered that humans live in society, the social sciences are born and the social anthropology is born and so on. And now you, now you, have, um, now you have these AI powered networks that create a reality that is not comprehensible in the language, in the logic of society, because it's something different, it's something new. That means the companies that build networks, for example, Facebook, the engineers that are working there, there is actually directly a philosophical dimension to their work because they're creating a reality that we cannot subsume under our prior ways of thinking, under our existing ways of thinking, it will not work. So that's the level where I think the integration must, must happen between, between engineering and humanities in particular because humanity scholars can be experts in studying the reality effects of technology. Now, it's not that the technology exists here and here is society and there is some effect. No, no, it's that a new reality is created by a technology, new ways of thinking, new ways of doing. And, and imagine you would have an integration on that level that you could basically teach what's going to be the philosophical dimension, the reality effect of a technology, then, then engineering itself would become a philosophical practice. It would be new, it would be different. And, and another way of thinking about this, for example, is you, because you mentioned Galilei and Newton, we have one project at the Berggruen Institute with Google Quantum AI. And one of the, one of the, the paper is actually published in archive today, my first quantum AI paper, uh, 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 pretty proud about that. But one big question that emerges there is, when you engineer from a Newtonian perspective, you operate in a fully determined universe. Machines do not have a single degree of freedom. But in a quantum AI world or in a quantum mechanical world, there is irreducible uncertainty. Could you basically build machines in terms of the non-determinism, the freedom that quantum AI allows for, that quantum mechanics allows for, and thereby give an agency to quantum AI machines? Well, now you can no longer do engineering in terms of Newton because then you would build a determined machine. So now, now engineering is no longer like about finite things that you can plan and then you simply execute. Now engineering is a true experimental philosophical science. That's actually massive. And where are the humanity scholars, the, scho the philosophers of mind? Why, why are there not more in this Google quantum AI department in Santa Barbara? Where are they? 
they create new realities. We should, we should be there. We should study that. We should help guide them. So th this is the level on which I think it, experimentation must happen. So, so let's extend that from just the academic realm to uh, the, broad, the broader social realm. And, and New York Times reported yesterday that the EU uh, was moving toward a policy on regulating AI, um, particularly in terms of how AI might threaten safety, might threaten fundamental rights, um, limiting access to our private thoughts, uh, the policy is, is uh, very advanced and, and being spearheaded by looking for new norms for what they're calling AI justice. So part of my question is, is this premature? Is it overdue? Do we need not just the AU, but a global perspective on this? And I want to push the question a little bit even further by asking this. Let's, let's remember today is Earth Day and that AI is to a great extent an extractive industry. Um, and there's a lot of damage potentially and existing to the non-human environment with mining practices, with disposal practices, relating to the cultivation of rare earth and lithium and the things that are, that are used in our technology. So um, in the New York Times article, I did not see anything that gestured toward the environmental conflict that we're experiencing toward AI and the guardrails we need to put up around that. So Robert, I'm, I'm just to clarify, what, what do you or what does the New York Times mean by AI justice? <laughs> I don't understand the term. Well, it's the term from the New York Times article. So right. yeah, so I, I think essentially I, what I would imagine uh, that it entails is um, putting guardrails again on things that might threaten what we consider to be fundamental human rights, particularly uh, the right to our own private thoughts, uh, the uh -huh. right to the dignity of humanity, those kind of broad humanistic perspectives. But um, there's not a great elaboration in, in the article. Right, that's what I thought. I just wanted to be clear um, before I just flew off in the wrong direction. Um, I will say that in the city that I live, San Francisco, we have barred facial recognition um, for use in courts and, and uh, well, everywhere actually. Um, and I think that, unfortunately, I don't think there's enough tracking of what the consequences are so that we can compare what happens in San Francisco in 10 years, over the course of 10 years with the city that, a comparable city that does allow facial recognition. Uh, to be used in courts and other purposes. So we could start to actually, um, I mean, one thing we can do is, is actually start to um, define what we mean by AI justice. Uh, we might as well do it, you know, uh, anywhere we can. Um, any group can take that on and promote it. And then um, find a group to actually um, study the, the launch, make a longitudinal study of what it means in a comparative sense. So I think, you know, without a lot of evidence, I won't call it data, but without a lot of evidence, then we don't really know what we're talking about. I will just, just to remind um, those who were not able to see Wendy Chun's brilliant, um, you know, lead um, talk, her keynote speech, she was showing um, in great detail how machines predict the future based on past patterns. So they end up predicting the past. Um, rather than predicting the future. So one of the things that we would have to consider in AI justice is uh, a deep analysis of the flaws of AI to begin with. Um, and I would just point to how does AI uh, figure into contingency because at least in American courts, contingent factors really matter hugely when, it, when a jury, for example, makes a, makes a decision about the degree of criminality of something. You know, what are the extenu extenuating circumstances? And those are human judgments. So um, the, the scope of AI's, of AI justice could be quite huge. And we could, you know, we could parse that. As to extractive industries, I think that that's just a problem with computers and all sources of all information technologies and everything else that we live on. So I don't think it's particular to AI. However, I would say that ignoring it is, follows the historic human pattern of ignoring the cost of extractive industries. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I just wanted to echo that with the, I'm sorry, if I may just, I want to kind of go again with Abby on this, uh, which is, I think that the issues of, um, uh, all the issues attendant with living in the Anthropocene era and with, with uh, our, um, the ways in which we build technologies, not just, not just the ones we're talking about now, but essentially all of our technologies are just not built in the way that is, um, they're not, uh, they're, they don't, ba they're not based on creating cycles uh, of uh, being able to uh, um, you know, place, place materials and, and entities through a cycle the way it, ha it does occur in, in, in the um, biological world when things become very large, they all, they all operate in cycles in a way that, that human technologies don't. So I, I, I don't really see it as a specifically related to this particular area in that same way. But on Earth Day, it is important for us to say that this is one of the biggest problems humanity faces is that we don't have the knowledge or the ability to do this. Um, and it's not, a, it's not like this is a totally new problem. I just want to say, to be, you, know, you raised the example, could we know that climate change is occurring without having all of our AI tools? And I guess there's no question they help us to understand the full dimensions of it. But I will point out that Arrhenius, uh, I, don't, I can't remember the year, it might have been 1892 or something, calculated the climate sensitivity, what would happen if you, double, you know, what, what would happen to the temperature if you doubled CO2? And he got it really close. I mean, it was a very, you know, he made, maybe, maybe he had some compensating errors and stuff like that, but fundamentally he understood the underlying uh, uh, physics of that and made a pretty good estimate. And so we've known this for a long time. We just haven't wanted to, uh, or haven't been able to think through how to make the changes that are attendant with it. Um, the, the, the other just quick comment I wanted to make is, uh, I think a lot of the discussion here is centered around what is one of the biggest um, uh, aspects of our whole discussion here, which is, um, are these tools able to create knowledge or are they uh, independently? Or are they simply tools in our hands by which we are able to create it? And, and to me, that feels like um, it's where um, I think it falls far short of being able to create it independently. Uh, it's powerful methodologically, but it's important to put it in the right category. And, and, and uh, that's, that's my view. Sherry? So, um, yeah, AI justice is, is really a term that I've been using a lot. And I started using it um, because all these other terms fell short. So I'm quite an outsider coming into this stuff. You know, I'm, an, I'm a painter. <laughs> but um, when I started looking at things and really getting into it and reading a lot, um, the word ethics was used. It just started getting used, actually. And then... Um, trustworthy became a thing, responsible became a thing. And I read a lot. I read every single a page that had those terms on them. And after a while, they start to lose their meaning because they don't have a lot of meaning attached to them. They're not really well-defined. They just are used. They're nice words. Like, what does it mean, trustworthy? Can the AI be trustworthy? Isn't trust between two kinds of people like you promise something and then you deliver it? You know, there's, there's not well-defined terms. And... Um, as I started getting a little bit disenchanted with the use of how uh, ethics was and how ethics started to get um, co-opted and used by uh, people for any type of purpose to like basically sell more um, tools and sell more AI and make more promises to um, the uh, government agenda of how they're going to dominate in that area. I started also seeing um, AI in human rights organizations the way they talk about it from Amnesty International and um, you know, the engine room in Berlin. So they talk about other stuff. They talk about justice and they use it in a very classical sense. And that's why in, even in climate change, we have climate justice because they're not just looking at like, oh, the harm's going off in the future. They really look towards the past because, you know, you can learn a lot and you can see where things have gone wrong because that bias within an AI, for example, is not a technical problem. It's a very much a societal one. And then it's not just that. It's also this whole other structure of like, well, where are these companies doing? Who are they hiring? 
who's making these decisions? Who is it impacting? Are they part of this decision-making process? So justice really belongs into that term. And there's a lot of number of people who've been working with that term, such as um, Joy Bolomini with the Algorithmic Justice League. And I use her work as an example all the time because she has been successful. Um, for example, she is an AI researcher. So she has all that research stuff the technical know-how. And then she is a poet. So she also brings in the humanities because that can reach people. People hear her talk about these issues and they care. And on her documentary Coded Bias, I think is um, actually on, on the site that people can watch um, that she's in. So then she also works with um, lots of different institutions, community work. These are um, groups all over the country who are feeling the impacts of AI, groups that are like maybe talking to people who have facial recognition systems set up in their apartments and they don't like it, you know? So then they work together and they start to pressure policymakers and then they pressure um, companies to change stuff. So a lot of what we saw with the backlash for facial recognition with companies saying and promising they're not gonna work on it anymore. Like IBM promised they're not gonna do it. Then Microsoft promised they're not gonna do it. And even Amazon <laughs> well, you know, for one year, <laughs> they're just taking a little break. But then um, you had these little like legislations pop up in San Francisco over in Boston and they're just city by city. They're just working it. But then yesterday over um, we had the announcement from the EU, their big proposal for the regulation for um, the European approach to AI was published. I haven't read it yet other than this really quick synopsis. But it does have a section on facial recognition that was completely directly informed by Joy's work, which combines all of these different things that can make an influential change. And I think that just exemplifies how humanity has, has changed our, our course here, because without that kind of work, we would definitely have facial recognition systems. Isn't, so that's all true. And simultaneously, facial recognition is so much more complicated, right? So it's banned in San Francisco. Of course it is in public places. Each time you open your iPhone, facial recognition, each time you use Apple photo to sort something, Google photo or Facebook facial recognition, each time you go to the airport and you use clear facial recognition. So self-driving cars, facial recognition. In fact, you want, you know, I remember us talking to Joy, uh, Sherry, um, um, partly about cars and partly about drones, for example, killer drones, should they have good facial recognition? Because otherwise they might kill the wrong person. Now, you might say drones shouldn't kill anybody, but you might also be pragmatic and say, well, if they kill somebody, then please, good facial recognition that also recognizes, especially because of Joy's research, uh, uh, black women's faces. So facial recognition and facial recognition are two separate things right so it's like you, how it is used in public surveillance and how it is used in all kinds of other areas if you break it down further and you you go to convolutional neural nets which are sort of the basis of most facial recognition then the same the exact same kind of technology that is used for facial recognition is used in in breast cancer scans or in radiology etc so it's such a multi-layered level that 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 uh, I think it's always kind of important to, uh, to to make to make these distinctions about is facial recognition. Where would you want it? Where would you want to actually have investments in it, in its research? And where what kind of uses would you want to would you want to prevent? Otherwise, we we lose uh, like we narrowly zoom in as if the human and justice big things are all at stake in facial recognition. Um, and th th there are a few other questions we can ask too. Because let me just say though, for example, um, let's take the advent of uh, the CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing. Obviously a powerful technology, can do a lot of good, could do some horrible things. And in that field, when it was created, people understood they needed to immediately think about the ethical implications. That the work itself 
can't be done separately from having the discussion about the ethical implications of it. And I think that's a principle that applies to almost any new technology. It, it, I don't know of an important technology for which that isn't true, where the engagement with ethics and the issues of justice and so on shouldn't, should, it should be part of the growth of the development of the field. Once, it, once it's recognized that this is something that could be powerful, the embedding ethical thinking into it, and that means enlarging the number of people involved in thinking about that, not just to the immediate inventors, but to a larger group that will be impacted by the technology or that have, have really um, uh, delved deeply into how to think about questions like this. But that should always be taking place. And here we have an example where instead, we maybe have gotten carried away in the early stages with the positive prospects and, and neglected to embed the ethical thinking at the onset. And, so, and that always is hard because then it's very hard to, uh, to re-embed it and it takes a lot of struggle and there can be some, uh, you know, bad really not good consequences from that. So I hope we at least take the lesson that we're inventing powerful technologies. Let's make sure we always have uh, the, the ethical lens embedded as early as we possibly can and not, not a decade or two decades later. Abby. So Paul, thank you. I have a question for Paul um, and that is, so my intuition is that it's that way, um, you know, the, the, the people who invented or discovered um, CRISPR-Cas, um, you know, they came from a bio, biological and medical profession in which these issues are always salient because it's biology and biology and particularly medicine is highly regulated. Um, it's everywhere as far as I know. Whereas in uh, the physical sciences, this is not necessarily true. And I'm wondering if the kind of ethical thinking actually occurs in physics, for example. Um, uh, and I'll leave aside the story of the, you know, the tortured uh, atomic scientists who didn't want the bomb after they already invented it. But beyond that, um, I was just thinking that, you know, the internet itself, or I should say the World Wide Web was devised by people who, um, from their own accounts could only see it as a good thing. They didn't really understand its social implications that it was a billboard, basically a billboard or um, some kind of a blackboard where anybody could post things and they could only see the upside of it. Um, and those you know, cynics like myself in the, in, in the humanities just thought, oh no, it's another technology which is ta touted to be only for the good. And people who invented it didn't seem to understand that other actors would immediately find their way there and corrupt it. And so I just, or use it for their own ends, I should say. Um, and so I'm wondering if this is a problem specific to the, the, the physical sciences and computer science and engineering, as opposed to the ethical training that everybody in the biosciences gets. That's a question. Yeah, well, <laughs> I would say that in, Nanotechnology, which is my field, mm -hmm. the issue of ethical implications was embedded very early. I'm not saying entirely successfully, but it was present. Um, in fact, in the earliest um, formation of the um, uh, National Nanotechnology Initiative, a certain amount of the funding was specifically allocated for thinking through ethical and environmental implications uh, in the United States. And Europe went much farther and put in a kind of, or at least let's say, um, had some aspects of em em embedding a precautionary principle, of, uh, which I, I think probably went a bit too far uh, of wanting to, not do something until you could be certain it wouldn't have bad implications, which is a very different kind of criterion. Uh, so there is at least that example, but I don't disagree with what your with, with with the premise of your question that it's not uncommon for discoveries to um, uh, to be um, 
uh, embraced very optimistically because the people at the center of the creation just can see those possibilities and, and are often not able to conceive of the, the uh, downsides. And um, the consequences of that are that then we end up um, sometimes forgetting how big the positive consequences are. True. Some yeah. of that's happening in this discussion, right? I mean, obviously, uh, all of these tools we're talking about are doing immense good in the world uh, at the same time that they're causing a lot of uh, the concerns that we're, we're focusing on. So uh, I guess uh, my, I don't disagree with you that, that we could do much better at this uh, across, um, the, across the physical sciences and, um, and, and in areas of engineering where the distinctions between physical and biological sciences anyway are becoming sometimes much less clear. Uh, so, so I think that's a, uh, that's a very important thing for us all to bear in mind who are involved in trying to create new science or new technology that we, we, we should really be learning early and, and maybe that's a big uh, component of what should be embedded more into the uh, university and college education. You know, in the medical sciences and the life sciences, ethics was was only becoming a big topic right after Tuskegee and other experiments. So medicine was actually an intensely unregulated science in the United States uh, till the 1960s with respect to minorities really badly, but not only there, any heart surgeon could basically try out a new method. Uh, if the patient died too bad, if it was successful, oh, maybe I get the Nobel Prize. So it, very famously, Philip Roth, uh, uh, David Rothman, for example, has written a beautiful book on the history of bioethics in the United States. And, and um, uh, the beginning of recombinant DNA led to a famous uh, conference uh, yes. in the Silmar, but it did not lead anywhere to a big, uh, glorious agreement about bioethics. took a couple of years. On the other hand, the very first people to raise ethical questions about machine learning there are two physicists and an AI engineer, one of them at Berkeley, Stuart Russell, and the physicists yeah. were Max Tegmark and, and Stephen Hawking. Um, so, but you, you, you entirely to your point, Abby, the two physicists were basically in, like acutely aware of the atomic bomb and what happened there, and they didn't want to happen something to something like that to happen again, which is why they raised the questions. Now, the concerns that they had was well, super intelligence will kill us all. You might say that's not exactly the question of AI, just AI and justice or social justice that, that should have been asked, but, but they, they did try to make an effort and Max Tegmark to this day leads the Future of Life Institute in which Stuart is quite involved and with whom I've been collaborating a couple of times and they, they are extremely sincere people for the specific questions that they are concerned with. Now, whether these are the right questions or not, this is, of course, debatable uh, entirely. But you also see the, the tremendous transformation in medical education um, with yes. the infusion of the humanities. So there, there is the understanding now that first year medical education can't just be anatomy, that a good doctor needs to be able to take a, a good case history, and therefore the study of narrative is essential. <laughs> And uh, so we often have, or um, uh, when I was dean, we would have our English professors be uh, involved in the teaching of first year medical students. Uh, and they'd be reading short stories and novels so they can uh, better understand narrative and listening uh, skills so they could take better case histories and therefore uh, be better doctors. So I think we have that infusion of, of the humanities and, and ethical considerations and all in all kinds of scientific endeavors uh, has made them much more robust and efficacious. Um, I wanna to go to a question from one member of the audience now, if I may. Uh, and she asks, how can we empower technical employees to practice ethical AI when they're on work visas and employers have different power dynamics? Anybody want to take that one on? 
You're yeah. muted, Sherry. Sherry, you're muted. Yeah, unmute. There you go. There's some workmen outside. So. That's a very, very, very difficult question. Um, you know, I do a lot to support the worker movement at, um, at all these different companies um, because I think that change is going to come from regulation and it's also going to come from internal um, tension and strife and struggle. Um, protecting uh, workers comes from having good whistleblower protections and funding whistleblower um, organizations that can help like coach people and get them lawyers because what we are seeing a lot of is people who are refusing to work um, and they do this on uh, many levels they will either refuse to just work on a project they don't have they don't have ethical agreements with and they'll be quiet about it and it's not too much of a problem or then they'll refuse to work on the project loudly and then that becomes more of a problem some people just say that they're going to quit and they leave the company some people never work for those companies to begin with. They are like blackballed because they have looked at their track records. I know a lot of people who won't work with tech companies and work on a certain technology altogether. We saw this with um, a couple of engineers who furthered um, computer vision tech and they refused to work on computer vision at all. So in order to be able to empower workers to make ethical decisions, and I think we want that because we don't know what's going on. We, and they know, they know what's going on, is, is pushing for regulations that protects them. So we would need to, and it's even hard now for to get these visas, you know? And there's even at schools, there's, I have professor friends who've been waiting to come to the States, but they don't have, during the pandemic, they don't have the correct visa um, anymore. So we don't have an environment that is um, nurturing and protective of, of workers. So that is a really big pickle to try to change. We also might want to talk about the, the whole incentive structure that we have in, in companies and government agencies around AI vis-a-vis uh, -vis the exploitation of, of discriminatory assumptions and practices. I mean, what, we've talked a little bit about changing the dynamics of universities, but um, the implications in terms of how government agencies and corporations often do um, code biases into uh, AI practices and exploit these discriminatory assumptions and practices, are there ways to uh, change incentive structures? You know, if, if I was thinking about this in the um, when we were talking about um, you know, the question of building ethics into programs. I think actually, if, and I think universities have already shown this, at least preliminarily, that if we actively recruit more minorities, uh, more communities that have felt themselves historically to be the victims of various technologies, you know, um, Dwight's mentioned uh, Tuskegee, but I think that, that it would be critically important for industry and government to be as active in recruiting these communities into their professions which I grant is extremely difficult because there's very little that is attractive about um, other than perhaps their salaries um, to communities that have felt themselves neglected or abused by these industries. But I do think changing something from within is the only way to change the culture. And so I think that's one area where we could advocate very strongly for more diversity in companies and, that would start with the universities and the education system that um, cranks out highly qualified people who are uh, don't look like us. I, I think there are some really, like one of the most wonderful efforts, I wonder if Sherry agrees, is, is AI for All, uh, founded by, by Fei Fei Li and Olga Rusokoska and run by Tess Posner. They offer um, AI classes for high school students, particularly for, for uh, underrepresented minorities. And they work closely together with universities like Berkeley. I think they have by now over 30 campuses in the United States where they mm -hmm. offer summer schools um, for boys and girls, um, young women and young men, but high school students, so minors. And they have a pretty good track record of getting um, of having long-term success, i.e. of getting these high school students then to the uh, actually really studying computer science or, or, or taking on an AI degree. Now, whether they're recruited later by companies or not 
is a completely different set of questions. Google has had just a, a, a series of very public problems uh, because of their agreements with historically black college universities from which they then didn't hire anybody. Um, but one really, really very powerful problem in that respect too is that um, AI research, the compute required to do uh, cutting edge uh, AI research and the data required to do cutting edge AI research is by and large in private companies and not in universities. It's actually not at all in public hands. Um, and so uh, the, whether diversity will be successful or not is, is uh, um, not only an educational question at that point, which is a, a, a true, true challenge. Um, yeah, we definitely need a new moral economy, you know, because um, I mean, I, I really, I do like AI for all, but then, like you said, it's like, well, then do they have jobs when these young people are, are trained to program AI? And not only do they get job offers, if they get those jobs, are they supported? Are they allowed to speak up? Are they allowed to get promoted? Can they run departments? And, you know, you don't see a lot of that happening. Um and I, I see a lot of Asians in, um, in tech, right? So people think it's not as much of a problem, but you don't have um, any Asian woman leadership. You don't have them in, um, in positions of power. So it does have to do a lot with that. So diversity is not really enough. It's, um, inclusion is a whole different category. And we have groups like um, Black and AI, for example, and they... Um, they started, um, Timnit, um, Gebru started that one as well with some of her friends. And they started it because when they went to a conference, there, there weren't any other black people. So they're like, well, let's try to change some of that. And um, they struggle every year with getting visas for the conference for people who have been selected to um, you know, show their papers and share their knowledge. And we still have these kinds of conferences in places where it's difficult for people to get visas to from all these other countries. And we don't have these conferences in other locations. They're always here or it's convenient or these Western places, you know? So we don't necessarily need to just keep bringing people in. We could just maybe reverse a little bit as well and put our resources elsewhere. So I want to ask a question from one of our um, prior panelists uh, and invoke that question here. And, and it reminds me, I, I recently uh, read Ishigura's new novel, uh, Clara and the Sun, uh, which is about uh, an AI um, from the point of view of an AI. And it, it questions the whole issue of empathy, human empathy versus AI empathy. And, and uh, this panelist ha has asked, um, is it okay if we can project or can we imagine AI writing the New York Times ethicist column? So will we get rid of Anthony Apaya and have AI writing our ethics columns for us? Who would train the trainer? That's my question. <laughs> right. who's, who's going to train them ethics? I mean, humans don't always do such a great job. So, I mean, we could always try it, but, uh, but it's tricky as it is for humans. I guess the reason we like to read a pious column is because every circumstance has enormous moral complexity to it almost every time, right? And those seem to me to be almost precisely the situations where these tools don't do so well. Mm -hmm. It's also very, you know, it's kind of funny how, how present the Berkman Institute is because Anthony is of course the chair of, the, of our prize committee of the Berkman Prize and it's kind of, Funny, but but this is one of the things where, where Paul's distinction between humans and tools, so to speak, it makes a big difference, right? So if it comes to ethics, you would want to have some existential dimension of understanding. You would want to have some understanding of context, and without being existentially at stake, it is extremely different, uh, difficult to. Uh, mm, trust an ethical con or to take serious an ethical consideration because only by having a stake, um, you know, um, can, can you, can you appreciate the ethical uh, dimension? Um, you know, there's this famous, there's this um, 
famous saying that that um, AI doesn't give a damn, and as long as it doesn't give a damn about the world or about ethics or about anything, it's it's fairly difficult to trust it. Doesn't mean one cannot train it on empathy. Doesn't mean that one cannot train uh, GPT-3 to write an ethics column. It might do a, f a fabulous uh, job, but this existential layer will not be there. And that makes it, at the end, for humans, entirely possible to engage, very difficult to fully trust. I think that that's um, where we should appreciate AI as non-human intelligence and not as human intelligence. And you know, this yeah. question actually, um, I'm sorry. Um, one of the reasons I got into this whole AI ethics world to begin with, because I was working at Autodesk and I saw how creative AI had gotten and machine learning had gotten. And I was very concerned for the future of work and unemployment and worker displacement. And um, because I was a creative and I didn't realize they were coming from my job, you know, I was like, oh, they can do graphic design, design cars, you just put some parameters and spits out things, you know? And um, then I got, I got, you know, I learned a little bit more and I grew a little bit less worried because um, I think absolutely you can um, train GPT-3 even now to write a pretty decent column that you wouldn't be able to tell, but would I read it? Would I care? Um, my friend, Memo Octan, he's an artist, and he gets this question asked a lot. Um, you know, it's like, oh, well, do you think AI can be, be an artist just like you, be a creative artist? And he's like, I will care about AI being an artist when I care about AI. Like, what's his life? What was his childhood look like? You know, um, what, what's behind it? Because it's not just a visual aspect. It's about these human stories, this connection that we have between people that's behind just the words that we're saying. There's this other context, like Tobias is saying. Yeah, I, I, sorry, Robert. I, I just say, you know, one of the things that's interesting is, um, and here I'm making reference to Isaiah Berlin's um, value pluralism, that there are values um, and that humans have that are inherently contradictory and you have to make a choice. And that's not something that an, uh, a machine can decide. So just even taking the question of liberty and equality, they are in most circumstances mutually exclusive. Um, and so those are, those are the kinds of things that a P is very good at pointing out the limits of reconciling um, these values that conflict with one another, they're equally valid. And I think any machine um, or any human for that matter, who doesn't have a profoundly tragic sense of life shouldn't be involved in ethical decisions. Uh, that's a great answer. So let me ask each of you to make a, a concluding comment and, and answer, uh, since we're talking about the future of AI and the humanities and also we're revolving around Abby's question uh, how do we get there from um, from here? I'd like to ask you a kind of multi-part question and ask you to respond briefly, um, and we'll go in reverse alphabetical order this time. So what would success look like in a decade? In other words, what would what might be present in the world that isn't here now? And what's the crucial humanities intervention needed to enable that success? Okay, so Sherry, let's start with you. Well, let's go the other direction. <laughs> <laughs> you're the Try artist. You can create. One. Um, you know, if you're going to aim that high in 10 years, I would really like to see um, the whole incentive structure change for how we um, have an economy and how our politics are run and um, how we make companies. Um, maybe just like soften capitalism, capitalism up a bit so that we can have... A, a place where you can have um, AI that is for the people, that is mindful. Um, all those words that we've been using, it'd be really nice to have it um, be meaningful and not just the word trustworthy. Like have it be meaningful, it means it needs to have accountability behind it, not just transparency, but we need to have like some structures where people get in trouble or governments get in trouble even, and that you need the, like we can maybe have some councils where we vote on things together so that we make AI that, um, 
that we actually want. I think that starts with um, public education. The one thing I saw when I was doing a lot of my research on the ecosystem of AI is that we're really missing on connecting with the public on, on the um, outcomes of what's actually going on. We, they get some scandals here and there, like Cambridge Analytica scandal, or they feel the impact of disinformation in their daily lives. They might not necessarily be like, oh, that's an AI that's serving me all this content that's making me more angry at my cousin. <laughs> or, um, you know, that's my personal story, but, but we need to have these sort of events or conferences or um, engagement places. Uh, we have lectures that people can go to, but it's not really engaging with the public where it's listening and hearing from them. It's more like talking at and, and announcing. It'd be really nice to have a more integrated sort of interactive experience where people get to make decisions and learn collectively. Thank you, Abby. Yeah, that is a tough question. Um, and it was a two part question too, Robert, that was unfair. I, I, um, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Um, you know, what I would really like to see is um, is AI developed in such a way that when people make these grand statements about transformation, that they don't say we want the transformation which is going to affect every industry and every society. I don't think industry ought to be given priority. I think that's just a problem with um, capitalism or, or I should say modern thinking. Um, what I would really like to see the humanities do is to engage in this conversation about what is, what is good for us by talking about hum humans as self-made beings. That is, we're not an end. We are, a, we are, a, we're self-creating. We are people who are, we're, we're creatures who are constantly making ourselves and that we're essentially a project and that we have as much to say human humanists can remind us of what the, the, the history of humanity and what we have achieved, not achieved, and to historicize the whole process of creating a new technology, normalizing it, and then if necessary, regulating it in such a complex society as we have. Tobias? Uh, it's difficult for me to, to articulate hopes without articulating hopes about what the technology will actually, uh, where that will go or what it will do. So I, I do hope that there is a um, significant process in, in self-supervised learning, um, meaning fewer data, less uh, compute power necessary. I do hope that there will be significant process uh, in generalizations across domains that would be amazing. Um, I do hope that any form of technology that is um, created and any form of, of application that is created in with, with AI or machine learning will, um, will be examined according to its reality facts uh, and will be jointly examined by scholars who are trained in the humanities and, and technologists, broadly speaking, and that products will be uh, product development, so to speak, will be a deeply humanistic uh, technical discipline. Uh, you know, sometimes I, I think we need a new practice called part philosophy, art, and technology in a single framework. Um, and and uh, if I, if I add one, because three answers to a two-part question is best, um, then I hope that we can build an educational infrastructure that actually equips people with the expertise to accomplish this part, so to speak. Um, thank you. Thank you, Paul. Well, I think my hopes are a little more modest. I hope that the, the computational lens and the humanistic lens are, are working together in education and that um, the, the, the humanistic ways of thinking are really used to shed deep light on what's happening with the new computational tools, that those are integrated working together in education, and that that also then helps uh, all of our societies across the world to use this very powerful new set of technologies, limited but very powerful set of new technologies, to use them in ways that uh, really are ones that we, um, we believe have had good impacts and not the kinds of 
uh, either unethical or unjust ones that we've kind of touched upon and, and which are also so very possible. So that, that's my hope. Humanistic and computational lenses will work together and not at cross purposes. Well, thank you so much, Sherry, Abby, Tobias, and Paul. Uh, thanks to all of those who have helped made in our image, artificial intelligence and the humanities a huge success. It's my sincere hope that this gathering will spark continued conversation on the questions we've raised and will lead to greater collaboration to address the challenges we've outlined over the past 15 days. Recordings of the talks, presentations, and panel discussions will continue to be available through the National Humanities Center's YouTube channel. And I encourage you to watch any of the sessions you weren't able to attend live and share them with others who may be interested. In the days ahead, we'll also be sharing an extended bibliography and a teaching syllabus based on the conference proceedings. We'll have recommended readings and provocations. Those materials, along with a series of podcasts on the topics we've been exploring, will be accessible through a dedicated page on the National Humanities Center's website, nationalhumanitiescenter.org. The podcasts are being created by a team of graduate students from across the country who've been working with us to preserve, distill, and disseminate the important conversations we've been having. I also wanna offer special thanks to RTI International, for their generous support in presenting this conference. And they, along with our other sponsors, the Burroughs Welcome Fund, the Glaxo Educational and Cultural Outreach Fund, the Research Triangle Foundation, the Center for Documentary Studies at Duke, Unite AI, and the Center's institutional sponsors have made it possible to offer all of these events free of charge to the 1,200 attendees from around the globe who've taken part in our conversations over these past several days. I hope you will all continue to engage with the center on this initiative and in our other work. Thank you again for a tremendous conference, everyone. Be safe and be well. <laughs>